All right, check this out. This is Invincible, the comics. And this is Invincible, the show. You get what I mean? No? Okay, well, here's a video essay. Also, spoiler warnings for season one of Invincible. So there are two big moments in the plot of Invincible that seem like it was first written around. The universe's equivalent of Superman killing the equivalent of the Justice League and turning out to be the bad guy, and the reveal to the relevant characters in the show that he's indeed the bad guy. Killer idea, right? Oh yeah, this, this Omni-Man dude, what a great guy, what a great father. Really knows how to raise his son right. Really knows how, really knows how to put him on the right tracks. When I watched season one of Invincible, I was goddamn floored. I was immediately invested from episode one and continued watching every episode the day it came out with equal interest. And when I was done with season one, I was like, oh, I'm gonna go read the comics. So I did. I um, really know I was good. Now, disclaimer, I'm talking about season one source material. I haven't read further in the comics. For all I know, it might get better. And given that the original writer is on the team producing the show, I suspect it probably did because the show feels like this huge upgrade in storytelling. Actually, that probably makes him one of the few examples of it also actually changing their story for the better. God damn it, JK Rowling. When I say Invincible was first written around those two key moments, I say that because in the comics, that's basically all there is at the start. You see a bit of Mark, you see a bit of his family, his dad, the equivalent of Superman, Mark gets his powers, you hear about the Justice League equivalent, and then slice, boom, bam, look, he's the bad guy, and not long after, the immortal comes back from the dead, and hey, now Mark knows he's the bad guy, too. And despite these being the biggest moments in both the comic and the show, and those moments themselves being left relatively the same in both, to me, it felt so lackluster in the comics. Why? Well, you'll probably say it's about investment, and I think you'd be right for part of it. It's very common in storytelling at this point, and everyone knows it, that if you're gonna kill a character, it's more effective the, 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 It's more effective the more you care about them. Yes, in the comics, you really don't care about the Guardians of the Globe. They're literally only ever name-dropped before it's time for them to actually die. To the comics' credit, they still have their introductions where the, the writer tries to like get you to care, but those scenes are literally back-to-back -back with their deaths. In the show, they at least have the opening scene where they fight some baddies, to establish them more, you get to see them being heroes, saving people, getting one-liners, jokes, and showing their positive qualities. There's just generally more opportunities to get invested. But I don't think that's all we need. It's not just that you don't like them or care about them, they don't even feel like they matter. When we talk about killing characters and by extension making these moments matter, we talk a lot about liking the characters, but we never talk about spectacle. What I mean is the events of the story have to matter, change things, affect things. In a show, a lot of time goes into establishing not just the characters, but their influence. It establishes the lake so that when you throw the rock in, it ripples out. In the show, you get to hear the main character's friend talk about the Guardians. The security guards talk about them as well. They come up in conversation, not just as exposition, but people have opinions on them. You're such an omni-maniac. Way to root for the underdog. Sure, he's hot and all. And that mustache. I know comic fans probably find all the changing of characters, races, and sexualities jarring, but, but but this guy has way more characters than flamboyant gay, I'm, ju I'm just saying. Also, while I'm here, I, <laughs> I understand you guys were going for diversity, but guys, guys maybe, <laughs> maybe you shouldn't have made three six of the Guardians black. They're the first to die. There's more than just opinions too. You get world building about how flying works in Viltrum, so you feel like it's actually like a place when you find out the character who said this has actually just been lying through their teeth. So it's like, what else are they lying about? Uh, also seeing these dark suspicious moments from Omni-Man, like when he punches Mark or when he gets angry or suspiciously quiet about his son getting powers, uh, th this stuff gets recontextualized with this reveal. In episode one, you're like, wow, this dude trains Mark hard. And then in episode eight, you're like, this dude trains Mark, really? And having Mark and Debbie be more developed means the actions made by Omni-Man have more weight to them as you anticipate their reactions. The thing that really makes this moment isn't just the deaths, it's the anticipation of what those deaths change. Even on just a micro level, having all the Guardians just be killed instantly like they do in the com comic? Comic? <laughs> That's a different type of comic. Even just on a micro level, having all the Guardians just be killed instantly like they do in the comic feels anticlimactic, but here you see all their reactions. It's kind of like, kind of like in Pokemon or any like generic anime. You know how there's kind of like this weird obsession where every character has to have a line and reaction to something when something happens? Wait, is that- But how come? Oh wow! Agron? This is a bad example. Here it just doesn't work because this twist doesn't justify it. A better example comes to mind is probably like the newspapers in One Piece. 
that allow all the important characters in the wide world to react whenever something big happens. And in Invincible, it's absolutely a good thing to see their reactions in detail too. This is a jaw dropping moment. I wanna see their jaws drop to, uh, I, I guess that counts. It's not just one reaction either. It's broken down into several different escalating moments. You see their worry about the call being a trap, the confusion and betrayal when they see who it is, their horror and anger as they watch each of their friends be brutally murdered one by one and their desperate struggle to understand why after all hope is lost. In the comics, one guardian gets to have one opinion on one thing and that's it. And the whole thing feels so much worse for it. To the comics credit, the Omni Man who slaughters them instantly feels more powerful, but uh, you're trading off a lot of engagements just for that. Even the fight itself being one-sided means you miss out on a fight. It just kind of feels like there's a lot of missed opportunity. Next thing you know, the comic is rushing forward to the next big moment, and to me that feels like the consequence of a self-conscious writer. And I don't just say that as an insult. Wait, <laughs> I don't just say that. I don't say that as an insult. I say it as projection. Because I recently started a webcomic, and I think I made the same fuck up. Because when you start writing, you don't have experience for what parts of your writing engage an audience and what doesn't. So what happens is you take the thing you're most confident in and try and rush there as fast as possible. Which for me was this princess character killing her family, burning down the castle, and intentionally creating a power vacuum so that she could take it all back to prove a point. Spoilers for Elk Bound. I, I don't. I don't. I don't need to do that. Now, most of the comments were positive, but the one criticism I got consistently on the writing was the pacing is too fast, and I wasn't sure how to interpret this at first. Because, like, how can the pacing be too fast? I understand if it's too slow because it means the engaging parts of your story are too far apart for your time investment to be worthwhile. But if there's no time at all between the engaging parts, I mean, I mean that's just a good thing, isn't it? And then I read Invincible, and it hit me. When people say the pacing is too fast, they don't mean they literally were engaged too much or too fast, what they really mean is that they have perceived that something obviously engaging has been skipped over given the logical progression of events. Which makes perfect sense. I kill three important characters and throw the world into chaos. That's a big thing in any story, but you're not invested in these characters or the world. These characters aren't even shown or speak, and I kept world building exposition out of chapter one intentionally. Now I didn't intend for you to be invested in these characters or the world yet, but you could have been had I built into it, and this moment would have been better for it, but I had a specific way I thought to engage my audience and I headed straight for it. Now to be fair, this part of the story was also set up to hide some elements for later, but if I were to extend things out to make this moment stronger, I could have had uh, Gale, the other main character and perspective character, interact with the king and uh, try to at least forge some interest so it feels important when he dies. The king could take some special interest in him and create some mystery. There could be an attack on the castle, which the king repels. I could make him terrifying or intelligent and make it crazy to know that the princess somehow managed to kill him. Or when it comes to the actual burning, I could have at least, I don't know, shown the match? <laughs> I need some sort of build up for the actual act. I don't know. I could have also shown the king's influence on the provinces under his rule. I could have shown the rare peace that was created by the king in a world constantly at war in spite of the screwed up way it was achieved. That way, when you burn it down, you know the scale of how things will change. I could have even just had Gale build up a special connection to like a garden or a structure that burns down. I could have shown how sucky his life was as a slave to make it more cathartic when he gets freed. When I think about it, there's a lot of things I could have done. I had very easy potential ways to make this moment stronger and engage the audience but I just didn't cash it in. This is why I say looking at Invincible's comic, the pacing is too fast feels like a very apt criticism. Not even for the sake of making these moments stronger. There were so many opportunities for moments that were good in their own right that simply feel skipped over in hindsight. And that's something Invincible just carries on its back heading into the second moment. Yes, the comics does get to it faster, much faster. But in contrast, even though it takes till episode eight to get to the next big moment, I still loved watching two through seven. And that moment was so much stronger when we actually got there. I love the show breaks up the plot into logical segments to get the most out of it. The Guardians are dead, what happens next? Well, someone has to clean it up. Boom! We get Cecil's introduction and the powerful reaction that really sells the gravity of the situation. And even the nurses have opinions on the Guardians as well. In the comics, Omni-Man doesn't fall unconscious at the crime scene, but by adding it, they can break the plot into further segments. Nolan starts off unconscious, and you get the characters interacting without him or any information as you anticipate him waking up. You see Debbie react to the agents at her door, and Mark meets Cecil and deals with the responsibility of replacing his father and failing. And then Nolan awakes, and the questions start, the suspicion builds. The investigation itself splits into two factions, Damien Darkblood and Cecil, who work together at first, but as Omni-Man becomes the main 
suspect, they conflict. The demon chasing Justice and Cecil sending him back to hell just to keep Omni-Man from thinking they're onto him, seeing the potential danger in an honest investigation. Not only does it establish Cecil as this grey pragmatic character who's cool in his own right, Damien Darkblood fulfills a role in the story as well, not by cracking the case as you expect, but by making Debbie suspicious of her husband and revealing her true role as the inciting incident that leads to our next big moment. And the scenes that come out of that are so good. This is the one character in the show who can say, Fuck you, Nolan. And stand a chance of getting away with it. It's so crazy to think a moment like this just didn't exist just to get to the big moment faster. It's tense and a great moment for her. And now that we've built up investment in her, Cecil has the perfect excuse to take her back. Oh, fuck. Take her with him back to HQ. Jesus fucking Christ. And now that we've built up investment in her, Cecil has the perfect excuse to take her with him back to HQ, which results in being able to see all her reactions to Nolan and Mark's fight, Cecil's cold hearted decisions, and her husband saying that she doesn't matter. In the comics, there's just nowhere to be found. In the same vein, the new Guardians of the Globe get to see what's happening too, but that's not all. In hindsight, there's missed opportunities all over the place. After we know Nolan's the bad guy, it's the perfect time to tease why and show his dark side, so they have him go through a portal to an attacking planet by himself, and you get to watch him genocide the whole fucking planet. When the secret's out, Cecil, like a total badass, goes out to confront him in person and stall for more time. The teleporter he's been using up until now to get around becomes the perfect plot device to allow this conflict to happen and actually allow Cecil to stand a chance without detracting from Omni-Man's power. All the work in general to make Cecil feel important plays a huge role in making these scenes be the best they can be. His medical facilities, invisible armed forces, and utilizing of other heroes plays a huge role in making him feel ever present. And humanity's desperate all out against Omni-Man feels like this amazing climactic conflict that both shows how incredible this guy is, but how resilient and resourceful and terrifying humanity can be when shit hits the fan. All of that is lost in the comics because you were Russian. All you had to do was stop. Have a time. I could gush about other things I enjoyed, but none of them are specifically related to these big moments. There's a lot of characters and plot points that are introduced as is and work by themselves. I enjoy robot subplot with the Muller twins who have much more character now, and Machine Head and Titan had fantastic introductions. Your lives worth minimum wage. What do you want to fire your guns in the air so you tried your best and we all walk away happy? Guys, it's like 18 bullets in the ceiling and nowhere else. Are you gonna say it was fucking Spider-Man? I don't know, what I'm saying is Invincible is this very interesting case study to me. Looking between the comic and the show, there's a very clear lesson in storytelling which, appropriately, is as clear to its titular character as it is unclear to its main antagonist. What makes the end result valuable isn't the result itself. It's the experiences forged on the way to get there. What will you have after 500 years? You, Dad. I still have you. <laughs> hey, also, if you like the video or are curious about the comic, check out patreon.com slash studio high C. Studio High C is a public domain production studio that I started last month. Everything I and my studio make is public domain or copy left, so you can do whatever you want with it, even earn money off of it. We're currently taking losses right now since we just started, so I'd appreciate if you checked out Chapter 1 of Airlock Bound and see if that's something you're interested in supporting so I can, like, you know, make more of it. Chapter 2 should be out on the 15th of June and you'll be able to see all of our improvements from Chapter 1. Though honestly, now that I've made this video, I really want to go back and add extra to fix the pacing problem, but that'll have to wait until I'm more stable. Thank you! Dude, the preview for Episode 4 makes it look like he killed the Guardians because Debbie questioned him. <laughs> Are you questioning me? <laughs>